All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Thursday morning, and uh, welcome to the weekend. It's going to be the next couple of days. Uh, thank you so much for joining our webinar this morning on electrical safety panel discussions. Uh, this is going to be an hour and a half duration discussion with our experts here on call. You can see them on screen, uh, Charlie Miller, Terry Becker, and John Kolak. So these are the three experts who will be talking to you, answering the questions from electrical safety. And uh, they're going to just give the context and uh, color the, paint the color as far as the questions you asked and what the application responses for those questions. Again, I would like to have Charlie, Terry, and John introduce themselves, 30 seconds quick intro. Charlie, please go ahead. Oh, uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Miller, I um, write electrical books and uh, teach a lot of uh, seminars, uh, mostly in a PA 70 electrical safety. Been doing this for a long, long time. Thanks, Charlie. Terry, please. Uh, Terry Becker, I'm based out of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, I'm a CSA Z462 founding member, first past vice chair, currently a voting member. I'm also on the CSA Z463 Mains of Electrical System Standard, a founding member, voting member, uh, voting member on IEEE 1584. And I provide electrical safety consulting to help companies build compliant electrical safety programs, do external electrical safety audits, and provide arc flash and shock training to uh, industry Canada, US. Glad to be here. Thanks, Terry. John, please, John. Yeah, I'm John Kolak, uh, based out of Texas. I am a uh, electrical engineer. I have a, I'm a certified safety professional, and I'm also a journeyman lineman, an IBW trained journeyman lineman. Uh, 43 years in the business, uh, 25 doing this consulting thing, and I'm great, grateful for the opportunity to work with you. Hope we can help. Thanks, John. My name is Banu Srila. I'm the director of technical marketing here at Grace Technologies, and I'll be moderating this safety panel discussion. So let's go to the next slide and I'd like to read a quick disclaimer. And before that, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to type in those questions using the webinar console on your screen and we'll try to answer them as time permits. And secondly, we have about 40 questions that came in through the registrations. On the priority basis, we're gonna answer those questions first and then if there are any follow-up questions, we'll just definitely look into it. And if you are unable to answer every question that you're asking, we'll ensure that we'll follow up through an email communication and ensure that you get answers to any of the questions that we missed out, okay? So with that, I would like to go to the next slide and uh, read a quick disclaimer. So again, uh, this is very important for us because everyone comes from the electrical safety space. So this disclaimer is very important. I'm gonna read this through. The responses to the questions and the views and opinions expressed during this webinar, electrical safety panel discussion, are those of the speakers based on their professional experience and personal capacity and does not reflect the position of the organizations or other committees they represent. Because I know two of, two, two of our experts represent committees. I just want to make sure that's clearly defined. The recommendations and suggestions provided during this webinar session are purely for informational purposes only and cannot be used in real world applications without a detailed analysis and return authorization and consent from the presenters. By participating in this discussion, the attendees consent to weigh all the liabilities arising from the use of information presented and any misuse of information that could result in a personal injury, damage, or any other negative consequences on the presenters and the organizations that I present, okay? So additional information, questions submitted as I mentioned, along with the registrations will be answered first. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions, please use the webinar console to uh, type in your follow-up questions. And all attendees will receive a CEU certificates because this is not a product presentation. This is purely industry-centric and safety topic. Uh, and lastly, please do remember to take the exit survey and provide your feedback at the end so that will help us to refine the future webinars that we uh, want to come in front of you, okay? So with that, let's dive into the first question. Uh, so what is the next area of focus when it comes to electrical safety? So this is one question that came in like electrical safety has been existing for several decades and what is the next area of focus that needs to be and since this is such a general question i'm going to ask uh, all the experts to give their opinion and where do they see that this electrical safety is going to or where needs to be more focus or emphasize needs to be put in that space please go ahead john 
Well, I think one of the things I've noticed is coming down the pike is more having to do with human factors engineering, having to do with the human human performance issues that have been expanded in the 70s. But I think that's also the next front that I, I, I think is happening. Uh, but I think these other fellows are more qualified to talk about what's happening in the regulatory world than I am. Charlie? Uh, well, I'm seeing more, and, and I know Grace has come out with a, a safe test point uh, a number of years ago, and anything like that that can help uh, make it safer to get into cabinets. Uh, and I know right now uh, Grace is working with Adam Power uh, for a smart breaker, and that breaker, uh, solid state breaker, can trip instead of milliseconds, it can trip in microseconds, and it, to cut down incident energy that that would just, and that technology like that, I, I think is tremendous. Thanks, Charlie. Terry, please. Uh, well, I got a few things. I, I think um, I think we're going to see more regulatory oversight in occupational health and safety regulations in Canada, potentially. Um, we'll see. Um, another gap area is this proliferation of EVs and solar farms, large solar farms, 1,500 volts DC on the collector box. And I think we could have maybe unqualified workers that aren't adequately trained, you know, working on these solar farms, right, instead of qualified journey electricians. So I think there's some gaps on solar, large solar farms, even small residential. Um, the other thing, too, is, is I really see a, a lack of electrical safety programs. And what's, what's happening is buy arc flash and shock PP, send workers on training, get study, install labels. And you have no way to validate that the residual risk level to the workers is actually low or medium because you're, you don't have a program, you don't have any way to monitor and measure performance, right? So that's sort of a laundry list of a few things there. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rudy. I think uh, one thing I was thinking probably there's a question for all three of you from my side, right? So we've been coming across a lot of latest technologies and uh, evolution of new things and such, right? And then when you talk about the safety, it's always about compliance or a minimum requirement, what companies do this, correct? So on top of that, I also see there's a lot of shortage in qualified personnel. So what do you guys think the technology is going to change? Meaning, do you guys think of any uh, connected devices, the Internet of Things, or any artificial intelligence that's going to come into this play, place that will probably change this space? Uh, I'll pick up. I think there's been a lot of a, a, a lot of evolution here in the last decade, and I, I think then there's still a lot more to, to come. I think the future is is we will have elimination as a priority by substitution and prevention through design or safety by design. You know, your products are an example of that, and there's more of that coming, right? So, and we need that elimination is a priority. But it, we're gonna we've got all this existing equipment, so it's gonna take decades and decades and decades. Right. So we've got legacy equipment that, that doesn't have all these, you know, advancements. And, you know, so we've got probably, you know, 100 years before we see electrical equipment that it, it really eliminates exposure as a priority. And, and, and so that's that's my comment there. Right. Thanks, Terry. Let's go to the next question from the audience. So this is for you, Terry. How detailed you talked about electrical safety program and one of the areas for focus right? just before you address. How detailed does the safety program need to be, right? So because some companies say that they have a program, some says they don't have a program, some says they have something in place, and some has understanding of just sending their workers for a training as a program, you know, where, where do you draw the line and what does that need to be clearly? So, you know, we can start with NFPA 70 and Z462, you know, Article 110.5 uh, and CSA Z462, Clause 4.1.7. Um, they provide some guidance on what your electrical safety program should include for content. Then we should look to occupational health and safety management system standards like Canada, CSA Z45001, based on ISO 45001. We have a complete annex that's not in 70E, Annex A, that cross-references how Z462 can be used to comply with the requirements of Z45000, sorry, Z45001. ANSI Z10 is the U.S.'s Occupational Health and Safety Management System standard, plus OSHA actually provides a recommended practices for safety and health programs, and, and, and it, it gives you seven sort of framework or table of contents requirements that, that, that they're looking for. So we can use 70E, we can use Occupational Health and Safety Management System standards, 
and that'll give us the basis for the framework or table of contents. But you're right, Ben, what I see out there is, well, we've got a program, it's one page. We've got a program, it's 100 pages. It, it's not relevant to the page content. It's relevant to the framework and table of contents, and then you can defend it right against standards like 70E, ANSI Z10, Z45001, or that, that OSHA guideline. And not a lot of people know about that OSHA recommended practices for safety and health programs. It's a great document. And then you have to audit against these standards. So no one's auditing as well, right? So when I say no one's auditing, well, I've got a program, audit it. Audit your electrical safety program, which is a mandatory prescription requirement of NFPA 70E and CSA Z462. So um, I recommend that you know, a project execution plan is, is, is put together. You strike an electrical safety committee, and then you look to these standards for the framework or table of contents that should be in your program. Lastly, we have what's called a certificate of recognition a program in Canada where the OHNS regulator advises industry of a framework or table of contents for a safety management system. So we can use that same framework for an electrical safety program. And you get that program audited and you get workers' compensation premium uh, reductions in Canada if you can have an overall occupational health and safety management system. So there's lots of information on what an electrical safety program should have in it for the framework and table of contents. But you're right, I, I, I see... Well, I said it earlier, there isn't a lot of electrical safety programs out there that are compliant when you audit them against these standards that I've listed. Thanks, Terry. Do you like to add anything, John? I thought you were trying yeah. to add something. The electrical safety program serves a couple of purposes, but it's one thing you should hold up in, a, in front of OSHA, and this is the alpha and the omega. Everything you're doing about electrical safety needs to be fit into that. I need to just suggest for your listeners, there's, I mentioned earlier something called system safety engineering. For your safety people, get to know this because the safety system is well-defined. For 50 years, this has been defined, and it's also measurable. And there's also a, a fault tree that is associated with it called the management oversight and risk tree. What I'm telling you all this is if your people get to know what's in that procedure, it tells you specifically what needs to be in any system, any safety system, you can transfer that easily to the electrical safety system. And that would be the definitive reference point because you're not basing this on your theory. This has been derived over many years in the industry, in the engineering, uh, system safety engineering industry. So I just want them to know there's a lot of precision that's already developed and it's been on the books and scrutinized for 50 years. Thanks, John. Let's go to the next question. So this is for you, Charlie. Uh, this is on the uh, contractor validation evaluation. I'm thinking more like, I just put the question as it came in to the webinar when people signed up for this. So how do you do contractor validation evaluation? I think there's more to do with when they bring in external contractors to perform a job on customer premises, how do you qualify and validate their work or their safety procedures, what they do? Well, 70E uh, stipulates that uh, outside contractors have to have the same training, they have to go through the same um, electrical safety procedures that the company uh, employees go through and they, they they have to comply, the outside have to comply. And I teach in a lot of places and and I, that's one of the questions that comes up. You know, why are these outside contractors, why do they not have to do the same thing we do? Well, they're supposed to. Uh, they, it, it is required in 70, there's a list of, of things as far as the training, a list of qualifications uh, that that outside contractors have to go through. Uh, I would want to see, you know, if I was the the host contract or the host employer, I'd want to see uh, documentation for uh, NPA 70E training uh, that that they have gone through. That and I would also want to see if if they if there's a chance of them opening any potential live electrical um, equipment or doors. Then I would want to make sure. Uh, they have the proper shock and arc rated PPE that that they're going to need for that particular uh, facility. So, so a follow up question for you, Charlie. I think this is more like a myth or misinformation or understanding in the marketplace. So mainly, people think that if I hire an external contractor to come and work, so I don't have any type of a liability. That's what the understanding is. Some people think that I bring an external contractor, I am transferring the liability or risk to the contractor. So I just want you to expand on it. Terry has probably nodding his head. Go ahead, Terry. 
Well, again, OHS regulations, the, the overarching, what we call a prime contractor, uh, has overarching responsibility. Then the employer, then the supervisor, the contractor also carry OHS liability, right? So, but the host and contractor content in 7 and Z462 says that that's really the relationship. So Charlie nailed it that, you know, and he's, and he's right. I've heard electricians say, how come the contractor's not wearing our flash and shock? Well, so the employer that hires them is the prime. You've got to ask them if they have an electrical safety program, the training records that Charlie mentioned, and they should bring in the, be bringing their own arc flash and shock PP, and they're not boring yours. So, again, the same occupational health and safety regulatory oversight applies to the contractor as it does to the employee, but the company hiring the contractor has overarching additional responsibilities because you're responsible for them on your property, right? Do you want to add anything, John? Well, um, there's kind of a legal aspect of it as well. well there's, there's two schools of thought with contractor safety. One is the, the laissez-faire hands-off version, which means I spend all of our time screening the contractor and then you don't give them any direction or any training after that. The reciprocal of that is the hands-on version where you treat them like your own employees. You actually train them and equip them and so on. So there's a legal thing that I'm not really qualified to talk about. But having said that, there's some of it is illegal. I can, de I can delegate some of the risk if I, if I do that contractually with contractors, that's for your legal department to discuss. <clears throat> and you so can make them prime. The construction sites, you know, the, you will have a general that's the prime, and then they're on the client's yeah. property, but they're responsible legally for everything in the fence. But if right. I bring in just a, two electricians on a maintenance contract to support my team, then there's, then the owner that, that's hiring them is called what's prime and carries this overarching responsibility. But so does the employer and the supervisor of the contract employees. I recommend that contractors are under procurement processes, given a pre-qualification checklist. And I have one that I provide to clients say, here, this is how you can do better due diligence and ensure your contractors aren't gonna expose you to h &S liability. And then get, we get Charlie's problems taken care of mine. And then, and then contractors have to step up. They've gotta get programs. They've gotta get our flash chalk PP and they gotta send their workers on training because you don't want them on your site if they don't have those three things in place. Right, because your risk is higher if they get hurt, right, in alignment with your employees. You know, so it's a liability thing. John said it gets into some legalese here too. So, all right, can we go ahead, Charlie? What's yeah, yeah, a comment to make? I was going to say where it's located in 70E is 110.7. 110.7, 70E standards. 70. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, let's go to the next question. This is for. John, this is uh, when will we see OSHA regulate to companies the need for arc flash labeling for a three-phase electrical systems? Well, there are they already do that via the 70. Actually, um, the, it's already a requirement that they do a hazard analysis, and among the other things is the labeling requirements in the 70 apply here. So if they're going to access it in the field for maintenance or troubleshooting, it needs to have a label on it. OSHA already says that they'll defer to that. Now, remember, OSHA was written, and it's very difficult to change it. So they haven't made changes to this like we do with the 70 every three years. So you'll see it's a bit retarded. What will happen is OSHA will be essentially will say in generic terms, you got to provide your people protection from this hazard. Part of that is the labeling requirements. They will defer to that. So if worst case scenario, they can, can enforce the 70 via the general duty clause. So they'll cite you on 5A1, the general duty clause and reference the OSHA, the S70 book as a standard. And then later on, someday in the future, they may regulate that. But this is already a requirement. This is not something you'd be able to say if somebody gets lit up on an arc flash event on a three-phase system or not, it doesn't matter. They're not going to say, well, it didn't apply to you, so we're not going to hold you accountable to it. Uh, you're so, going to be so, required to protect them. So question for you, John, or even the other panel members as well. So you just talked about the citation to general duty clause by OSHA. So the question we get asked sometimes is, can someone, can OSHA cite based on 70E? No, they can only cite it on a known OSHA standard. So they will, if they can cite you on an actual standard, they will do that first and foremost, because general duty citations are hard to make stick. So you'll find that they'll, but again, the, 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 that's, that 50 cents will get you a cup of coffee after that. What happens if you say, I didn't manage it because I don't actually have to, but there's a, you're trying to get a loophole there. And if you're already thinking in those terms, you're already 180 degrees in the wrong direction. If you're looking for a loophole not to make this follow, you're on the wrong side of the road. 
rather rather than do that, try to figure out how to manage it effectively rather than how to get out of managing it at all. And if you're in the first place where they're trying to get out of it, you're you're pushing a rope. I'm a safety guy. I know this. Uh, if I can't get the management team on board and they're wanting to do it, you're not going to get very far with your safety. Okay. Thanks, John. Let's move to the next question. This is a long question. Is it safe to use NFPA 70E table 130.7 C15A or flash PPE categories for AC systems to choose or flash PPE if you do not know the fault clearing time of your switch gear? So here the person who put the question is the position where the management is resistant to completing the arc flash study, which would give them the fault clearing times, et cetera, as well as the category of PPE, but I still need to specify the proper PPE. So basically he has been asking, I was just told to go and use one category higher than what is safe or what is what do you think, but the issues with that is cost, dexterity, et cetera, right? So this is like a practical question. Somebody sent an email and asked me to uh, put this question and ask in front of you. So who would like to take the lead? Well, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, right. the, uh, I personally don't want people trying to do calculations on the electrical system and estimating fall current and clearing times because oftentimes that's, they won't know how to use that information or they'll miscalculate it. So for example, if you take an infinite bus, it's kind of a lazy engineer's way to do this. It actually won't necessarily give you the maximum incident energy. So you have to model a system for what's actually there rather than coming up with numbers you sort of pull out of the air. So you either use the table method or have a full engineering study, but don't be caught in the middle. There's a no man's land in the middle and you're gonna end up with your pants around your ankles. So my suggestion is, is you, uh, you manage the hazards either through a real study or the table method, never the twain shall meet. I mean, that's again, uh, Charlie, probably you can uh, comment on this too. The reason I'm asking is even the 70E says you can use either instant energy calculation method or the PP category method, but you can't use both, right? So you can't use either or or put both in a single context. So that's not going to be correct. So do you want to add anything to that, Charlie? Right. This this table, 130.7C15A, has parameters. It, it has the, the task. Uh, and the equipment in here, but all of that uh, in order to get the arc flash PPE category, in order to get the boundary, is based on parameters uh, of maximum available fault current, yep. maximum clearing time, and minimum working distance. And where it, it, it a an arc flash analysis is not needed for this. An arc flash, a, a system study is needed in order to come up with this information. Well, if 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 the company has a system study done that's going to give this information uh, with the the software programs that that are out there for arc flash analysis, they're one or two or three clicks away from having a full blown uh, analysis with uh, equipment labels. But this, these tables are based on, on per, using these parameters and be, being within these parameters. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. Let's go to the next question. And can I just comment quick on that? That um, go ahead, the, the table, the, the, the old HRC table method or the new arc flash category table method, it was always intended to not be perfect. Uh, it was meant to have you know, a simple method and not overcomplicate it. Yeah. And we've got commercial, industrial, institutional, you know, companies out there that that don't even have arc flash PP being worn by electricians still, and they don't have a lot of money. No one does these days. It's not a, it's not an excuse, um, but instant energy analysis studies should be the priority. But we're we're going to never get them done everywhere and get you know get labels installed you know everywhere. It's it's just it. So the table method, you, you, you know, I trained to simply check you know with infinite bus and a quick lookup table no motor contribution etc cetera, etc cetera, and then and then move on and if you're working downstream of a, an electrical protected device based on what the table provides you make an assumption that it's going to open in that clearing time right because the table is independent of confirming condition of maintenance that's another topic that's a risk-based discussion and using the tables too and then you use the tables but all that aside two eight volt three phase or higher right, minimum 8.0 calorie per centimeter squared all the time, every time, or 480 or 600, start there. Then use instant energy analysis or the table method to decide if you need an arc flash suit. 
right? And then I recommend a minimal work flash shoot of at least 75 calories, even 100 calories after that as the standard. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna move to the next question. Thanks, Terry. So this is gonna be an interesting question. The question is, panel starts about test before touch as a separate practice from the initial absence of voltage testing. So I, I'm assuming this is what they're asking. So with evolution of devices like Grace and other products that you can have a door mounted device, which is permanently installed and you can verify the absence of voltage from outside the cabinet. So if you use that approach or a method to verify the de-energized state in the context of what they're asking, once if you verify the de-energized state from the door front, can you use that as a sole means so that you don't need to go and test the conductors before touching them? So basically, once I'm done here verifying using any method at the door, I'm good to go, so I don't need to do that test before touch when I'm really touching the conductor inside the cabinet. All right, in, in 70E, um, I mean, this is a great question. 70E tells us that to put equipment, to establish and verify equipment is in an electrically safe work condition. There are eight steps. Uh, typically, the it's the the step eight is going to be over a thousand volts. So typically, 480 volts and below, it's going to be uh, seven steps. As long as uh, those seven steps have been established, they've been verified. The equipment is in an an electrically safe work condition. The Grace product from testing for the absence of voltage on the outside of the cabinet is is perfectly fine. It's great. It's it's very useful. It meets the requirements. And so as long as that's done, that's fine. The equipment, the door can be open without wearing shock and are created PPE. If the electrician, if the maintenance person wants to uh, go ahead and, and uh, test it before touch, that's not a problem. Uh, th there's another one that, and what I'm teaching too, that uh, I'll, I'll have a question come up. Can you use a non-contact voltage detector as the only method to test for the absence of voltage? Of, of course, everybody up here knows, no, you cannot. A non-contact cannot test phase to phase. It cannot test phase to ground, but can you use it to begin with as a first line of defense? I don't have a problem with that because you still have to go through all of the steps necessary. And so if someone wants to uh, test before touching then and do that with each component, they're, they're, I mean, that, that's not a problem. Now, the, a, a draft uh, a proposal that, that's been accepted in the first draft it, it's going to end up, it, uh, I mean, I, I, I have some strong opinions on that, but <laughs> what, that, uh, what that new section is going to say is it, when testing for the absence of voltage, you test at each point of work. Now, one of the things the, the committee has not defined what point of work is, it could be the same panel, it could be the same component, it could be the same building. Right. So it, it's not defined. So I don't know how that that's going to be. Um, how, how people are going to comply with it, not knowing what it's talking about. But uh, it, if it's per component, then you're going to have to test each component, each wire, uh, each conductor, each lug, everything before right. touching it. So, I mean, the biggest question or the challenge exists with that method is, Take an example of an MCC bucket, for instance, right? You have a main disconnect for the MCC bucket and which you will verify the absence of voltage, but are you gonna go and test at the thermal overload relay or the contactor and every subsystem within that or not, right? That's kind of what it will allude to, but I think uh, as Charlie said, we all have our own opinions, but uh, I mean, this, what do you think, John? Well, just the caveat about high voltage is that if you have a high voltage system, you got to get a visible open and you have to install a full set of personal protective grounds. If you've done that, if you've got a full set of grounds on and they're equipotentially bonded, then you don't need to test before you touch because you're sure that it's out of service then. 
So on the high voltage side, it's a, it's a moot point. We know the answers to that. If you got a full set of grounds on, you don't worry about it. On the other side of the equation, I would suggest, uh, think about it, make it personal. When you put your bare hands on it, you are testing it, aren't you? So <laughs> uh, if you're happy with putting your hands on it, knock yourself out. Personally, I don't know if you're trying to get out of doing it. It's up to you. It's journey, journeyman's call. So, so do you do you propose the 70E to revise the language to add the personal protective ground and even low voltage systems then? <laughs> well, actually, grounding is superior to lockout tagout. If you actually have lock, uh, full set of grounds on, it's wonderful to have. It's just the most low voltage systems can't accept them. So, yeah, so you're mostly just grounding transformer secondaries. But, but having said that, yeah, anytime you can get it yourself in a safer position, I would yeah. do that. I almost got killed three times. I was following the rule every time I did. <laughs> I still almost got lit up. So, you know, if you think it might reaccumulate, I think about testing. It's up to you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's a good good feedback. Yeah, thanks. Let's go to the next question. So this is probably going to be John again. So how to avoid hot connection and burns on a distribution systems? Clean the connections. Clean the if connections. You want to know how to, if you want to know if somebody's properly trained, they will clean the oxidation off the conductors. They will make connections with the right type of connection. In other words, trying to avoid bolted connections if you can, squeeze down or, or, or the ferrules, that's the way to go. So hot connections and all that usually are a function of resistance, and that has because you made an incorrect or not a properly made set of connections. So improve the, uh, clean the connections, use the right kind of connectors, pressure squeeze down connections preferably, that'll help with hot connections or burns on distribution systems. So, um, I mean, you also mentioned that even keeping the equipment in a proper maintaining condition is also very important for them to yes. keep it more safer, correct? So. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, your maintenance is especially important with the overcurrent devices because those have to operate at nameplate speeds. So you got you can fudge on your maintenance somewhere else, but not on your OCPD because if you have those, if they're not operating at nameplate speeds, those labels are wrong, understated. <laughs> Dan, can I just add a comment? In Canada, we created the CSA Z463 maintenance of electrical system standard here as a guideline in 013, became a standard in 018. And something that's different in it than NFPA 70B is we're, we're talking about maintenance for safety. And that's exactly what John said. We need to prioritize maintenance, you know, on our electrical protective devices that we're relying on, in this case, for instant energy calculations and or clearing if we're using the arc flash PB category table method. So maintenance for safety, Use risk assessment as a tool for arc flash and shock hazards, but use it for maintenance as well. Powerful tool is risk assessment to help make decisions. Thanks, Trey. Yeah. Go to the next That's question. Idea. So That's how do idea. you start or create electrical policies and procedures when the change or go against what is currently normal? So basically, how often do you revise or, I mean, what does that timelines look like from your, this for Terry. Go ahead, Terry. You, because well, you work with our program. So. 70E and Z462 change every three years. So there's your first sort of timeline. Every three years, you should be reviewing your established policies, practices, and generic procedural requirements. And then along the way, right, I recommend an annual. And with you, and if you look at the auditing requirements of 70E, right, in Article 110.5 under Electrical Safety Program, they say that your electrical safety program should be field audited, right? And and so that's that means Right now, the supervisor needs to be doing what I call supervisory level, level audit every hour, every day, every week, every month. And they need a tool to monitor that. So we need documentation filled out by the qualified person before they do energized electrical work. And guess what? 70E and Z462 also, also tell us that article under Article 110.5i, uh, right, we need a documented job safety plan and a, and a document, you know, before the worker works energized, separate from the energized electric work permit. So manage change. There's the other thing too, management change. I build management change into the electrical safety program and I provide a management of change form that has to be signed and executed when the program changes, when the study changes, when the labels change, when we do any power system modifications, right, that can impact the incident energy analysis calculations. So again, every three years, you need to update because it's having any change is at 462, but 70 and Z462, give us guidance on auditing. And then you need documentation in place for real-time monitoring by the supervisor. How do I know that the risk assessment procedure and the shock and arc flash risk assessments are actually being implemented by the qualified person? Because one thing they do is they fill out an energized electrical job safety planning form or checklist. And then the, the supervisor gets that and audits that. 
That's a tool for the worker, by the way. The, the supervisor doesn't sign that energized electrical job safety planning form, but they audit them. So you've got to audit. You've got to audit, audit, audit. This day, once a year, every three years, and update all of this to keep it current to the latest edition of 70 years at 462 because that's good due diligence. And the regulator would expect that. I've, I've, I've been training people that say, well, I was trained three editions ago as Z462. Well, you're supposed to be trained every three years. So it, it'll come down to testing your due diligence, unfortunately, if you ever get a significant incident or, heaven forbid, a fatality. And ultimately, that's when you'll know if you've got these gaps, right? So test your due diligence by testing what you've got in place right now and see if it would stand up to an OHS inspector in Canada or an OSHA officer in the US. I'd like to also toss in when you do your auditing, audit for effectiveness, not exactly. just the fact that elements are in place. So the point of the whole auditing process is to say, is it actually working rather than having a beautiful set of procedures and all that in place and it's not actually being used on the shop floor, that's like a handful of nothing. So my suggestion is audit for effectiveness. Is it actually changing the behaviors, controlling the risks? Then you're on to something, and that that will make an audit useful. And as a manager, I I can do something with the feedback like that if it's not effective. But if you're giving me something that's nebulous, I'm ill defined. I don't know what to do with that. I, so, I was like, I was exactly about to ask the same point uh, question, John, about don't do not the don't do the audit just for the sake of documentation. Do it to find out the effectiveness of yeah. what's implemented and find the gaps, right? So you yeah. got to be truthful, right? Yeah. I agree with everything Terry said. I just I wanted to add that one piece. One Absolutely. last thing. The electrical safety program is this overarching management system. The worker's not going to carry that around with them. right? You've got to give them resources and things that they'll carry around with them where they sure. can take the training and apply it. But they're really applying the electrical safety program when you give them <laughs> you know, material that helps them be successful. What I find in the training is they got a wire bound you know, or binder. There's all sorts of good stuff in there, but there's no takeaway like this is an infographic for boundaries or an infographic for PPE, right? So the management system has to be worth that framework to be defendable, but that's 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 not what you're going to give the worker. You're going to give them supporting tools from the program, work task tables. I actually modify table 130.5C because I think it's not good enough, right? And I actually add a shock column to it, and then you can do electrical hazard identification for our clash and shock and give them a more useful table. Right, that you know, so give them a table that gives them both our flash and shock, and it tells them when they need a permit, when they need a job safety planning form, and also advises them of the residual risk level of the work task. If we tell them and train them on the program, and they they apply those controls, but the supervisor has to validate that the controls are working. You've got to audit the PPE. I recommend that the rubber insulating gloves. We do a research on the training on them once a year. Right, once a year on the gloves, the rubber insulating gloves are critical. Right, so you got to, you know, well, we trained three years ago. Look at aspects of training, right, where you can take these gloves and actually have an, at least an annual and a safety meeting. Let's review the air and visual on these. Right, so again, that's all part of ensuring that your system's working. It's just mm -hmm. not assuming, right, and then actually redo some of this core training, right, for the electricians or task qualified workers. Thanks, Teddy. Let's move to the next question, guys. Uh, so this is for John and Charlie. So what are the common solutions to update older, for example, 10 kiloamp rated control panels to comply with the higher capacity requirements? Well, you don't you don't need to update the panel if there's less than 10 kA there. The only requirement is that the overcurrent devices can interrupt the fall current and duration, so it's a withstand rating. An interrupting rating, rather. So, if it, whatever. So, if there's only 5 kA there, you don't have to do anything with the panel except make sure that it all works on nameplate speeds. If it's higher than that, of course, you'll have to just upgrade the breakers and, in some cases, the, the conductors as well to handle the higher fault currents. But it's not a. It's not really the threshold of 10 kA necessarily. It's simply saying if you have a, a short circuit current, you have to be able to interrupt it at the, at the nameplate speed. So I, I think the question is around the lines, uh, John. Basically, I, I'm assuming the question, if something has changed in the fault current of yeah. the system, if someone has installed a 10 kA in the past, say decades ago, and something changed significantly within their premises, yeah, how do they upgrade to that? Is basically, as you said, increasing your uh, breaker uh, fault clearing 
the, I mean, the short circuit current ratings and then the clearing times and then going from that angle. So. And, and please remember that these calculations are done on a system, okay? It's, you're not just gonna go to the next transformer and figure the voltage fault current. I gotta come up with the arcing fault current in that system. So the whole system has to be modeled to capture that accurately. That's why we went away from the tables long ago on that issue, because we weren't getting the right information. So just please understand, if you're gonna come up with short circuit, in particular arcing fault current, you need to do that through the system analysis. Thanks, John. Charlie, do you wanna add, please? These these requirements have been in the National Electrical Code for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. A lot yes. of electricians out there say, "Oh, this is brand new. When did it come uh, come no. in? Like like before you were born?" Uh, this is. I mean, they've been out there a long time, and and uh, for interrupting current, short circuit current, uh, breakers having to have an uh, a AIC rating or KAIC rating. Um, the short the, the equipment has to have a short circuit current rating. Uh, there there's in there's uh, equipment that has a series rating. Um, I used to write and illustrate uh, articles in Electrical Contractor magazine, and I, I did a uh, I was actually going through I did a whole series through Article 110. It took maybe four three or four or five years to go through what. Uh, three pages every month and, and go through that article in detail. And I did cover uh, this section for interrupting current and short circuit current, not the engineering side of it, but just what does the code say? What do we have to do as far as if we're going to install this and we have to meet the code, the NEC, uh, that, that was where it came from. And if you're interested in uh, you can probably find this, go to Electrical Contractor Magazine and, and search for my articles. And, and now they, they go back quite a ways. I don't think they go back from where I started. I, I wrote and illustrated for the, uh, for the magazine for 19 years. So um, it may be kind of hard to find them, but uh, there's, there's good information in there about this. Uh, again, not engineering side. Uh, the, but uh, the actual NEC code rules side of it. Thanks, Charlie. And can I take a quick comment that this is a surprise when, when you hire a consultant to do an arc flash incident analysis study, they revalidate short circuit and then calculate abnormal arcing fault that John was saying. But what happens is I think companies are surprised when the engineer goes, oh, by the way, you've got some withstand and interrupt rating problems and you're gonna have to deal with it. And the client goes, what? I hired you for incident energy analysis. Now, now I gotta spend all this money? Right. Yep. So be, be buyer beware. And I don't think people know that the, the engineer is going to do short circuit first. And if they find problems, they legally have to report it out in the report. Right. right. And then now you got another headache that you have to deal with. And then, of course, you get your engineer's analysis and art flash and shock labels. But you have to deal and disseminate all of those withstand interoperating problems. I mean, basically, probably as if you were very true, Terry, probably they're looking at, hey, get me a new set of labels. I just want to put the re put it on the same thing and be done. Update the date on it. <laughs> so be, buyer beware that you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna have to deal with those issues legally, right? So right, but of course it's better to know than not know, right? I mean, exactly. True. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, we don't want to turn the radio up in the car when the engine is knocking. We want to find out what the problem is and then decide what to do then. Thanks. Uh, let's go to the next question, guys. Okay. So this is for Charlie and John. Is there a safe way to remove 208 volt or 480 volt panel covers to obtain wire and breaker information without PPE and training? And if so, what's the answer and explain why it is? Who are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> so Charlie and John, both you both can answer to that. You want to take this back off? <laughs> uh, the uh... Uh, okay, the, the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> and you, you probably saw that when I'm covering my face, not looking at that uh, question. Uh, in order to remove that that panel cover, you the, the person has to be a qualified person. The person has to be wearing uh, appropriate shock and arc rated PPE. If when they pull the panel cover off, they're within the arc flash boundary, they have to have uh, they have to be wearing arc rated clothing right. uh, and, and gear. If 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 when they pull the panel cover off, their fingers 
are within the restricted approach boundary, their fingers need, their hands need to be wearing uh, shock uh, protection, uh, shock uh, rubber gloves, leather insulators. Thank you, Terry. Uh, <laughs> now, if the company wants to go through the process of, of okay, let's, let's weld some handles on the outside. Once you take the cover off, maybe you can have a pulley system swing that mm -hmm. cover out where the actual person is not within the shock or arc rated boundary. No, they're not going to go to that, that trouble. If someone is within uh, these boundaries, the, in, in order to get that panel cover, they need to be a qualified person. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, we can globally say that whatever you're doing, you have to be qualified to do it. So, um, so I think uh, to, to just bring uh, that aspect to it, the only way you can do it without opening the covers and safely is looking at your documentation of the drawings of the facility and the breaker panel. If you have that available and it's completely updated, you can find the information without opening that cover. Is that right? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling the possibility, right? So I'm telling the need for documentation. Also exists, documentation right? related to a power system. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. So what are some best practices in documenting and sharing an electrical safety program with employees, contractors, or visitors? So best practices for documenting and sharing. So how can they all have one same understanding of what is applicable to them and what is not? So Terry, I think this is right under so your uh, expertise. For anything related to occupational health and safety, you've got to train your workers on your occupational health and safety management system. So if you have an electrical safety program, You've got to do rollout and orientation training for your staff. And then if you bring on your contractors, then you can do, again, part of their orientation. You can roll out your electrical safety program to them. You can provide them with a copy. So there's the other thing too. Provide your electrical safety program as a hard copy, digital PDF to your contractor saying, by the way, here's our specific policies, practices, and procedural requirements for our flash and shock. So give them a copy of your electrical safety program. Have a brief you know, orientation. A lot of larger companies have orientation online training. You can add, you know, one or two slides in there with some highlights. We have an established electrical safety program. You'll be bringing your own arc flash and shock PP. You're expected to have arc flash and shock training. And, and so that's how you can communicate this to not only your staff, but specifically the contractors like our previous question. So larger companies will have orientation videos. Smaller companies, you can have, again, a sit down, you know, orientation with a new contract you bring on site. Right, as the supervisor or procurement's involved, safety, right? So, but your electrical safety program, you need to train your workers on that. It is different than training on 70E or Z462. I'm now telling you my exact policies, practices, and generic procedural requirements that you shall follow, right? That will meet or exceed 70E or Z462. And that's what's missing. Oh, they went on 70E, uh, they're just going to do that. No, 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 no. You want to have your own electrical safety program and tell them you're going to apply that generic training against our electrical safety program to make sure that you eliminate exposure or reduce your personal risk to as low as reasonably practicable. So again, you need to communicate your own policies and practices. Don't rely on the training to establish them. But most companies, they're, they're using what they learned in 70E. And that's a huge due diligence gap and, and unfortunately high risk to the supervisor the first line of defense and we'll get the first question in the incident investigation oh they had training yeah but are you did you provide them any other direction uh so again due diligence is significantly lower out there right now with no electrical safety programs or electrical safety programs that aren't compliant or they just include little snippets from 70e and that's that that's what we're doing right so long-winded answer it's you know but ultimately you have to train your workers on what your policies practices and generic procedural requirements are right specifically thanks terry let's go to the next one so this is for charlie and terry so what is your practical opinion of installing variable frequency drives on wall versus in panel with less cost less square footage do our flash boundaries apply charlie do you want to start that one <laughs> I've seen this, uh, and I, this question has been come up with some of of the companies that I do some consulting and training for, and uh, where they, they 
the practice is just to install the VFD, uh, stack them on walls. And their opinion may be that, oh, well, they're, uh, they're finger safe, they're touch safe. Well, I, I'm, I would put it back on the company saying that, uh, all right, have them do a risk assessment. Is there an art flash uh, possibility? Is there a shock possibility? And, and have it come back to the company and then and have all that in writing. Uh, about, I've, I've seen this done. Um, uh, personally, I like the VFDs to be inside uh, enclosures. Uh, they do make the remotes that are the wired remotes that you can can operate it from outside of the, the enclosure. Uh, there's of course, there's all kinds of. Uh, lots and lots of installations and, and, and things out there. I know uh, Terry and John can chime in on this as well. I think there's the the question here is 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 if you have normal equipment conditions, the arc flash boundary doesn't exist, right? A VFD can be wanted on a wall and be operating. Uh, it's completely safe. And there's no shock potential to using the VFD to touch on the keypad. Well, Terry, it's running and it's making noise. Well, yeah, it's going to cool itself. There's going to be fans. So normal equipment conditions, we do not need arc flash PP. The arc flash boundary doesn't exist. It's when we're doing a work task as per table 130.5C in 70E or table 2 in Z462. And then we evaluate the condition of maintenance. And then the likelihood of occurrence of an abnormal arcing fault is yes, no. But you need to do risk assessment against that you know, decision. Right. And in some cases, if we have abnormal equipment conditions that you identify in real time when you approach the equipment and you think there's some evidence of pending failure on a wall mounted VFD, then you're going to turn the power off immediately. Right. So we need to start by saying energized electrical equipment is in a normal equipment condition and we don't need arc flash PP to operate it, stand in front of it, be around it. Right. Unless we believe it's in an abnormal equipment condition or there may be history right, that we've had some failures on a certain manufacturer of a certain vintage, and then you need to continue to use that equipment, but then you would create a special area and cordon off that equipment because the life occurrence is yes, that we may have an abnormal arcing fault without interaction, right? So long-winded question, it involves risk assessment, but we start by saying normal equipment conditions, and there's six parameters in 70 and Z462 that are valid, right? But you don't need PP to walk in front of a drive, Use the HMI on it. The arc flash boundary doesn't exist. Don't paint lines on the floor around wall-mounted BFDs or starters or panels. It's not valid. So what are, what are your thoughts, John? I'll defer to Terry and Charlie on that one. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, Terry, I think it's all valid. The only question I have is basically, okay, if you think there is no arc flash boundary that exists under normal conditions with the BFD being installed on a wall, so my argument, so I'm not trying to argue here, but I'm trying to ask you, okay? So I'm gonna ask you, what? how does it apply to the affected employee, not to the people who are performing the maintenance task? It's someone who is walking around that equipment, would there be a considered, considerable risk for them because they don't know how to handle it, they don't know what's going on here, but they are exposed to that on a regular basis. Will that create additional risk? No, and then then VFDs are installed in process areas as well, right? So our electrical equipment is distributed on process areas where we have operation staff. They don't need arc flash PP to be around the electrical equipment, MCC, switchgear, wall-mounted drives, drives that are part of a package, right? They walk up to it. These operators need to read the HMI. They may be authorized to change the speed with the HMI. There's no arc flash hazard to do that. Um, this is proliferated everywhere, and we got to be real careful here because, and this is one of the myths and misinformation I communicate, is that energized electrical equipment isn't is not inherently going to have an abnormal arcing fault on it unless there's some precondition that will be a higher likelihood of it occurring, right? So we have unqualified staff, qualified operations workers aren't qualified persons. They can't open up or take the cover off the drive, right? But they can walk up to it, they can use the HMI, they don't need arc flash or shock PP. Underneath this, do some minimum maintenance, right? So inspections and, and other maintenance to, again, continue to establish that your equipment, your electrical equipment is in a normal equipment condition, right? So, and then if an operator comes up and they hear something strange, they smell something strange, right? They see something strange, 
you need to train them to back away from the equipment and call an electrician. And if you're authorized to do so, find a way to turn off the equipment from a different source, right? So again, normal equipment conditions, and I call it look, listen, and smell consciously as an unqualified person that operates electrical equipment, turns it on and off, reads information on HMIs, right? We need them to continue to do that. They don't need full body arc flash PP or any arc flash PP. We've got to temper this whole thing, use risk assessment, very powerful tool. And risk assessment is two things, potential severity of injury or damage to health and life occurrence. And we need to put more focus on life occurrence, but it is acceptable for unqualified persons that are authorized, they have to be authorized to go up in front of electrical equipment, operate it, read HMIs, they need to be authorized to go in electrical rooms, basically operation staff, other maintenance staff. And we do need them to go into those rooms, right, related to electrical equipment isolations, right, as well, to apply their own locks and tags, right? So, you know, we got to so, keep I, doing that. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt here. I'm going to ask a question to other two panelists. Straight, simple answer. Do you agree with what Terry said or no? Straight answer, no explanation. Say that again. Do you agree with Terry or disagree? You don't need to explain why or why not. It's completely irrelevant here, but I want you to just tell me, do you agree or not, both of you, you and Charlie? Uh, in general, I agree. I think there's a, a yeah, in general, I agree. No, I just, it's the labeling thing that I'm tripping over here that you may still, this doesn't affect labeling. I still might have to label it if you're gonna access it in the field. And so, uh, it's perfectly okay to have a label on it with a 0, 0.0 calorie calculation, but what it's telling the user is that it's been considered. It's not a piece of equipment that we didn't know was there. We, we've studied it and concluded there is no arc hazard, and everything Terry has said is right. I agree with that. It's just the labeling caveat was all I was throwing in. Okay. How about you, Charlie? I agree with him. I, I think as, as long as the VFD is, is what's called finger safe, touch safe, but I also know that and and Terry is exactly right on when he said it has to be in normal operating condition. Normal operating condition, all the covers have to be on. Well, one thing that uh, quite often happens with VFDs is the little covers over the the incoming and outgoing power. Those covers get taken off and left off, and so then at that point, it's no longer finger safe and touch safe. But what Terry said. I agree that in in that case, that is not normal operating condition because the covers are not on there. Correct. All right, thank you. Let's move to the next question. That's an interesting topic though. <laughs> so this is for John. Testing requirements for portable electrical tools and equipment, handrails, et cetera, for 70B Annex, electrical tests quarterly, other standards or options. So how often do you need to test and what is the requirements on that? Well, a portable electrical tool, single phase now will require GFCI protection. So if there is any testing associated with the GFCI, that's all right. But otherwise, uh, the, and this, by the, way, by the way, made a 50% reduction in shock injuries. It made a huge difference to have that. But basically, the, uh, the GFCI normally doesn't need testing unless the manufacturer says it does. Thanks, John. Let's go to the next one. Uh, give an example of a proficiency test for lockout tagout that can be done other than in the field and will keep the employer in compliance. So this is for Charlie and John. So what can be done without having a field evaluation for the procedures? Because probably with given the COVID situation, I don't know whether <laughs> that's kind of the question they're asking. Well, what I do when I test people, Terry, I interrupted you. Do you want, do you want to go first? No, no. Okay. I when I lockout tagout, it does not sit on its own. It is integrated to the overall switching and processes that you're going to be using. So what I typically do for a field test is I have the person do everything from the job briefing discussion through this calculating the switching procedure, doing the switching, logging all that, getting to a zero energy state, and then returning it to service. If they can do that as the lead person under supervision, I consider that a demonstrated proficiency test for lockout because lockout is inherent to the overall process. It is not a standalone process by itself. In fact, you're required, if you're in a fixed facility, you're required to have a standing set of switching procedures for the common switching that's gonna be done on site. And having said that, lockout is inherent to that. It's not like you do the switching and the lockout, they're integrated. I'll give Terry the floor for that. Go ahead, Charlie. Um, 
It, well, I don't know if, if the question is asking about instead of being uh, done in the field with live equipment, uh, it can be in a classroom if you have um, certain props set up like disconnect switches and and things. Mm -hmm. And in some of the training where um, some of the qualified workers don't have their PPE with them, I have set it up that way that I will, and in fact, I've got a disconnect that plugs into 120 volts, and I, I'll have them go through the process for uh, putting the equipment into an electrically safe work condition, which includes lockout, tagout. So technically, that's not in the field, uh, but it, it's it's yeah. done in the classroom. Uh, and, and they're they're still uh, working. Um, I mean, they're still doing everything correctly, other than they're not working with um, sure. 208 or 480 volt equipment and and because they don't have the uh, proper arc rated uh, and shock PPE with them. Yeah. Ed Bano, can I actually add something? This is the word that hasn't come up yet is competency, right? So qualification is not competency. Mm -hmm. John said it, I think Charlie said it, you have to validate competency and it's a huge challenge because the supervisor is ultimately responsible and really, mm -hmm. Outside of you know the test, you, you you know well you can test you can test the worker, you can interview them, you can have a question set and see what answers they give you, and then you you can observe them. So three validation and verification techniques are testing, interviewing, talking to them, asking questions, see if they give you the right answers, and observe them. And you can and one of the tests it could be is get them to write a procedure. What? Yeah. Right? And and so and I find this is a huge barrier for qualified persons. They're so they're, 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 they're hands on, right? So when you ask them to write things down, it's like this, what? I got to write things down before I go do it. You know, they're just used to go doing it, right? And, and so another thing to be, to test proficiency is I need you to sit down and, and actually write out this lockout, tagout, switching order for me, and then we'll review it, right? So, um, but don't, don't give them any help. Let's make sure they give you something back that would be reasonable and, and would be probably correct. And it's the whole competency validation comes up all the time. I, 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 you know, that's all I can say is you have to use testing, observing, and interviewing, and then make a decision that they're competent. Thanks, Sri. Let's go to the next one. So, safety by design is a hot topic. What are some of the best ways the panel has seen to get feedback from the field up to the design? So, I think, uh, I mean, the person who has put this question is asking, how do you take the lessons learned from the field to incorporate those elements? while the systems are being designed at the design phase, right? So go ahead, John. Well, I, I always integrate, whenever I do anything like that, I integrate the workers into the process. I don't, I don't, I, don't, I wrote them to all the, whatever I'm proposing I'm doing, I wrote it to the people who are stakeholders. So I ran to the engineers, the safety people, to the supervisors, especially some of the journey level people who do the work. And I try to get perspective from all of that, and then I integrate it, and I get wrote it to one more time when I think it's a near final state, and then uh, we put it to use and see how it works, and tweak it as needed. So it's normally an iterative process for me, but I, I would definitely include if you if you stick the workers on something where they have a chance to make a difference to improve their situation, they tend to do pretty well. Terry. Uh, well, I, I agree with John. We got to get the operations and maintenance staff involved at the design-based memorandum phase, but it rarely happens, eh? So I've mm -hmm. been involved in several projects in my previous career where the best outcome of the project was integration of operations and maintenance staff in the yeah. actual engineering consultant's mm -hmm. office. And we sat there and we had regular meetings. So that's where you get you know, a, more, a more effective result is when the, the, the receivers of this design are involved in the design. And I, I advise that a formal design-based memorandum, I actually have an electrical safety design-based memorandum document that's then given to the capital projects team proactively from the operations and maintenance team saying, this is what we want. And we expect you to review these options and do a cost-benefit analysis. You're not gonna get your entire wish list, but we need integration of the ops and maintenance team at the design-based memorandum phase we need safety by design and substitution and prevention by design to be more integrated for electrical equipment specification. And then we're eliminating exposure. And yes, it's going to cost more money, but the benefit is we achieve elimination as our priority with, again, 
arc resistant switch gear as the norm, and that's going to come eventually. So that's all you'll be able to buy, right? So this is coming, but get operations and maintenance involved at the DBM phase. So I completely agree with both of your comments, but here is the challenge, right? Whenever you propose any safety by design equipment, it's going to increase the cost, as what you mentioned originally, right? So the major pushback I see, I was talking to one of the experts in electrical safety, and he was asking, he was telling me exactly why safety is a huge, uh, I mean, difficult to convince the management is it is not improving any process improvements. It's not going to show me higher productivity unless you can show. <laughs> but it will. Unless you can substantiate. Nothing is broke. Why do you need this, right? So that's what the question is. <laughs> but it will because we're going to have, you know, a whole bunch of things happen. We're going to have, a, a we would drive down the lake of occurrence of ever having an abnormal arcing fault. And there's the bottom line. No abnormal arcing fault, no arc flash. So if we can engineer anything in our impossible to have no abnormal arcing faults, you're going to have better uptime, worker safety, because we've eliminated, right? So there is, but you have to sell it. You have to market it as a cost benefit. And again, the oversight of the regulator is just going to keep getting more um, strict on energized work in general, in my belief. Right. The issue the, should be where there are, are much more accurate ways to calculate the finance of safety to figure out where the lines really do cross. And it's not just pulling numbers out of the air. And so you, as you work your way down the, the hierarchy risk controls, it gets more expensive. You got to have more and more people involved, more and more supervision, more and more to get an equivalent protection. So the lines are pretty pretty well defined when you do a calculation on a, on a system change, how much it would cost to do it and how when the ROI is there. Well, how, how long will it take to get your money back on the system? It can be very, it can, you can actually make system changes with data rather than just pulling numbers out of the air because uh, safety tends to get blamed for that kind of thing. So John, I mean, uh, when, when I go to the customers and they ask me all the time, how much does this safe test point cost? I tell them all the time, it's very inexpensive compared to a lawsuit. <laughs> well, certainly that's the, that's the catch all, but I, in a more practical sense as a manager, I want to know what, what, how much time to my ROI using actual numbers. And if, if safety people would get, Thing because they overstated. Yeah, I'll save you a million dollars by using this procedure. That undermines our credibility. So I just want, and by the way, if any of your customers are interested, give them my email. I'll send them some slides on the cost of safety so they can actually figure out how to cost it out. And, uh, and it'll get you in the game and I'll take them the rest of the way for free if they want. <laughs> ben, one fun. thing that I want to point out is the OSHA recommended practices for safety and health programs available online, free to anybody that wants it. It's hard to find though. It has two figures in it that talk about, you know, the benefits of implementing a safety and health program, indirect costs, workplace incidents, right? Mm -hmm. But it also has another graphic in it that's very valuable. And they do give some, you know, average number of claims decreased 52%, cost per claim decreased 80%, right? Uh, lost time per claim uh, decreased 87%. So this can be used with respect to this discussion of the benefit of substitution or safety by design, because you're right. going to have less incidents you will right because right? the light of an abnormal arcing fault <laughs> is negligible and if you install more insulation finger safe components and guarding the the shock risk is no longer there right mm -hmm. inherently yeah. yeah let's move to the next question uh, so john and charlie which one that kills a person we don't want anybody to be killed but even if you're given a chance it's voltage or current well, the, the, the current does. The current does the, the heating up of the flash. It's an, shock is an internal burn. If arc, arcing flash is an external burn, there is the amount of current flowing through that the does the same same reason it heats up the wire when it gets amperage going through it. So it's essentially the current does that. Yeah, and there's there's tables out there that uh, show how much current uh, for barely perceptible to. Uh, right. To where you feel it, to to and, and what those do. I know the, uh, I think the original ones came out from the Navy uh, years ago. There's others as well that are. Uh, and one of the things that's kind of interesting looking at it. So uh, there is one group or one organization that had a table based uh, differently between the the uh, where a woman feels shock and where a man feels shock. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it and and that's what the the original the guy who uh, invented uh, the GFCI uh, circuit breaker 
uh, the the uh, ground fault circuit interrupter, I think, based his uh, uh, the point uh, zero zero uh, uh, five, the five um, thousandths of a milliamp plus or minus uh, one thousand of a milliamp. Uh, it, it sure seemed like he based it uh, based on that. Okay, he's going to have it trip before the man feels it, but he's not going to have it trip before the woman feels it. She's going to feel it. Uh, the, the vote. I, I mean, I don't know. This was just uh, something that was kind of unusual looking at. Uh, if you find that table, but um, it, it's uh, there. There's and, and John is right as far as the the current is. Uh, Actually, it's a Canadian guy. Ralph Lee is his name. I use I use that data. Ralph Lee was a visionary. He 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 predicted the arc flash issue in GSCI 50 years ago. So actually, a Canadian is one. Gets credit yeah, for that. Uh, his name is Ralph. Ralph. I mean, he was the, he was the pioneer in that arc flash. He was, yeah, he was, well, he, he called the other electrical hazard. Like he wrote that in 1989, and so he was light years ahead of the rest of us. Dr. Ralph guy. from Edmonton, Alberta, my home province. I wanted to add a couple comments. We know from research, CF Delzio, mispronouncing that last name, for heart fibrillation probability, it's the current, the frequency, the amount of current, and the time that it flows to the heart to put it in a fibrillation. So it's the current. One last thing, electric shock sequela has not been discussed. So there's immediate effects of pain, heart fibrillation, or yeah. electrocution. And then what's happening is the current that momentarily goes through your body impacts us at the cellular level. And it's a lot of, you know, PhD physician stuff here. Cellular level, instantaneous current, like for a millisecond, it's impacted you. Now, multiple shocks could potentially, you know, accumulate and cause sequelae multiple long-term effects it's the current that gets into our body and impacts it at the cellular level right from just milliamps cellular level so a short-term low current shock can have long-term effects that are significant there's over 30 physiological neurological and physical potential effects of shock one year five years 10 years 15 years 20 years later and as you accumulate the shocks that could then um, be you know be, the, the the electrician could then have them, and it's true. It is not false. Electric shock sequela. Pay attention. There's information on the internet. University of Chicago Setri or uh, the Sunnybrook Foundation, uh, St. John's Rehab. They've been researching electric shock injury long-term effects for over a decade. Both the UFC Setri and the St. John's Rehab in Canada, but no airtime. No airtime. But I'm now working with an electrician. It's public. His name's John Knoll. He can't work in the trade because he has sequelae, multiple effects. We're going to be at the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop, and we've got a poster on electric shock sequela. So short-term effects, long-term effects, and it's the current. Thanks, John. Sorry. Thanks, uh, Terry. <laughs> the next one. Temporary power safety, bonding, and grounding. This is like... Looks like look like a comment. Do you guys want to just talk about anything that's critical about the temporary power safety? And Charlie well, and John. Tem temporary generation is bonding ground. That's addressed in the NEC. They they tell you how the, how they want it grounded and all that. When you're using temporary generators of different sizes, so it's already spelled out and what to do about it in the 70. I'm sorry, in the NEC. Yeah, the, the National Electrical Code covers uh, temporary power. Uh, it, it, and I'm not sure where this question, where this comment was headed, whether it's it's uh, really headed as far as, OK, if, if someone's working on uh, with temporary power and connecting uh, conductors up uh, when the panel cover is off, if they're going that route or if they're I know they mentioned bound, bonding and grounding. We have very specific rules in the National Electrical Code that covers bonding and grounding. So I'm not really sure what what they're they're wanting as far as uh, us to cover with this uh, this comment. We'll do a separate webinar for this shortly, just on that. The only other caveat is that your connections are all temporary. So that, that's the other part. It's hard to get a really good connection when it's temporary. So that, that impacts some of the system as well, but that's sort of a side issue. Let's move to the next question. I think uh, we have another 15 more minutes. So we got a lot of questions. We'll try to cover as much as possible so this is for charlie when plugging in a power tool into an extension cord with a gfi should we plug in the tool in first or the extension cord into the outlet 
Does it matter? I don't think it matters. Uh, there, there may be some scientific data that says one versus the other. I've never seen that. I don't think uh, because if you to get a uh, if you have a power tool, you're plugging it into an extension cord. You plug the extension cord into GFCI. Now the national the uh, 70E requires if you're using a cord connected tool or extension cord for uh, maintenance or construction, it has to be GFCI protected. Well, if, if you don't know whether the circuit is GFCI protected, have a, a device, uh, it can be an individual device, a, a short Thank cord you know. that is GFCI protected and plug one into the other. A GFCI plugged into GFCI, uh, if, if there's four of them in the circuit, it doesn't matter. Uh, in this case, I don't know that it matters. I, I I don't I don't know that it matters which one to plug into at first. Thanks, John. Next one. Next uh, one. So this is for John. So code for entering live panels. Is there a specific code that you want to talk about? No, no. Uh, I'm I'm not really sure what they're asking either on that one. Um, it, I, I mean, again, it's already covered. I, I, I don't see any point in commenting. I don't know what to do with that one. Okay, follow NFPA 70E, do risk assessment. So next question here, what would you consider the number one rule for electrical safety? This is a pretty loaded question. <laughs> just in just the simplest form, whatever you can say. Yeah, I think the loaded question come, probably comes from a loaded uh, uh, writer of the question. Actually, I know who this is, but um, I think the number one consideration is it is it is it is energized until you put the equipment into an electrically safe work condition. Terry, how about you, Terry? Three I, words. I just said it. Eliminate exposure, and if you can't, do a risk assessment and reduce the risk to as low as reasonably practical. John, I'd say play it like it's hot until you test and verify it's not. Okay. I would wear your gloves. If you work for me, you'd be wearing rubber gloves a lot more than you're probably wearing them now. But I would I would encourage you to wear gloves all the time when you're working with a neutral in the grounding system. Always uh, assume um, it's going to be yeah. a risk, right? So always assume that's the condition and then move that. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. I built a ESP for an FPA and have taught in 2018 and 2019. You both tell us how great technology products safer, right? Okay. <laughs> This is coming to the product question, which uh, uh, we don't want to address. I mean, uh, this, this again going to be an opinion, right? So I don't want to uh, justify our take, as I mentioned before, right? So in a simplistic way, what I can say is how this our Grace Technology product is safer is basically if you take the voltage indicator, it gives you it gives a non-qualified person or a task qualified person to visually verify the presence is there so that he can ask for help. He knows that something is not safe for him to go inside. If you look at the safe test point, it gives them the ability to verify the de-energized state from outside the cabinet without opening the cabinet, exposing them to or flash incident energy. Simple as that. So Charlie, do you want to tell in two sentences, if you don't mind, please? Um, well, I, I don't know. I agree with, your, with what you said about your products <laughs> to make things safer. So, and again, I'm going to add to one more point here, right? So safety is not absence of risk. I want to re-emphasize that point. It is not completely zero risk. Right. <laughs> I mean, people get confused with that. People think I put this and there's no, it's zero risk, right? So no, it's not. It's bringing the risk level to minimal, as minimal as possible, which is an acceptance of your, bound, your peripheral. That's it. There's always residual risk. Always. Residual risk exists. That's what I want people to know that, okay? So let's go to the next one. Uh, is a job safety briefing necessary before every opening of a panel? John and Terry. It's needed every time you're exposed to arc flash and shock hazards. It's independent of what you do next. You need to define the work task and then 7E and Z462, well, before they even said it, this should have been the case, right? Some sort of, again, job safety plan and writing some information down, right? So, but explicitly in article 110.5, I, right, you have to document your job safety plan before you're exposed to arc flash and shock hazards, right? So that, and then I do work task, electrical hazard identification and risk assessment 
as the worker, which means I have to do my shock risk assessment and my arc flash risk assessment. And all that happens, it needs to happen before, quote, I open the panel. But like even opening the hinge door is a work task that needs to be reviewed. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Does our flash requirements apply in a 480 industrial control panel if the disconnect inside the ICP is not isolated or guarded? John? Well, I mean, if there are exposed parts that have our flash potential, sure. I mean, if there's no if there's any potential for an arc flash hazard there, we have to quantify what they are and manage them accordingly. So yes, they, they apply anytime. And it doesn't have to be just 480. And we, we've had 120 volt faults that burn them. They're not supposed to ever happen, but we've had a 120 volt transformer that lit up a whole room. The dry transformer, 112 and a half kVA, and it lit up the room. So that's not supposed to happen. But you know, the more I study electricity, the dumber I get. It does stuff I don't know. I can't explain some of it. I've got to hold up this table, 130.5C, because it is a jewel in 70E and table two and Z462. That work task is one of the work tasks in here. I think it's work task 10 or 11. When you work in a panel that has you know, greater than 120 volts in it, you've got to consider the other voltage that could create an abnormal arcing fault. And if it's not guarded, right, isolated or finger safe, you, you may get into that right, somehow. So then you assume that you could be exposed to the higher voltage in the panel for abnormal arcing fault. So 130. table 135.c table, 31 work task, amazing resource in 70, table two and Z462. This is where you start. All right, thanks, Terry. Let's go to the next one. Uh, hard glow testing or replacement frequencies clarified. Does OSHA differ from Cal OSHA? Charlie? Uh, I, I think, John, I'm not sure as far as the talking yesterday. Uh, John, what were you talking about uh, with Cal OSHA versus OSHA? Well, theoretically, the, the state run OSHA programs are supposed to be at least as rigorous as the federal standards. And with Cal OSHA, my experience has been that's not true, especially in the high voltage uh, orders that they have. That being said, I, I think the testing requirements remain the same that every six months they have to be tested. But if I'm wrong about that, that's a good interval. Uh, and uh, just whatever the, the local agency's interval is, is all that's required. Uh, but if you if you send the gloves in every six months for a laboratory test, the air tests them each day when they're in use, you're going to be just fine. I, I just want to add that in Canada, in the province of Ontario, they regulate these rules, right? They're called the electrical safety utility rules, and it requires a three month retest frequency legally in Ontario. Every other province, it's voluntary, but in the province of Ontario, right, it's okay. legally three months. So you got to watch your jurisdiction and make sure you understand that. That's a good point. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, John. Let's go to the next one. There's a, a Manu, there's a question that I've had come up quite often. Uh, about testing gloves and, and they're supposed to be tested every six months. If they're new, they can sit on a shelf six months and then be uh, it, it used for six months. And so some customers, some clients have asked, well, okay, when they come back from from being electrically tested, they're sealed in the bag. So they are, they are new. Well, I know what OSHA says about this. They uh, they, they, I've heard them talk about it. I said uh, rubber insulating gloves are new one one time and one time only. Uh, so when you send them out to be tested, uh, they they are not new at that point. So you have six months uh, that you can use those from the date that's on that's stamped onto the rubber glove. And I, I clients and customers can do what they want, uh, okay. but if there's ever a problem. I know what OSHA is going to say about that. So next one is for John here. How do you calculate arc flash potential for fused DC systems? I think this is more within your expertise with the renewable yeah. system. All our, John. Yeah, well, we've got ways of calculating. We, we now, the software that we use now has the ability to model DC systems. And so like everything else, if you, if you correctly model the system, and this is usually an issue with uh, solar arrays, but, um, but actually it, we use, a different set of calculations, but, but it, is, it is just like an AC system, we're able to model it and, and use software to calculate it out. All of this can also exist in Annex D on the 7D, which gives you all the various formulas. Some of the formulas in there, if you're interested and you got a pocket protector, you can actually go ahead and figure out what's uh, what's going on in DC systems as well. So it's, it's just 
it's a known quantity, we can use the software to do it. All right, thank you. Let's go to the next one. So how long does standard everyday use flame resistant clothing last before it's recommended to dispose of like pants and a little shirt? Uh, I actually had this question come up yesterday and it, it you know, it, it relates to laundering, right? And, you know, when you launder clothing, the fibers come out of it. So the ounce weight per square yard will reduce with time, right? So you yeah. have to manage it. I, I don't think there's a golden rule. Um, I think some of the manufacturers of coveralls or shirts or pants will say, oh, 150 launderings, 200 launderings should be replaced. Um, mm -hmm. If your company uses large enough, use a laundering service, the laundering service will automatically replace the shirts and pants or coveralls that are that are created, you know, under contract at a certain number of launderings. And then the worker gets it back. They've got to, you know, there's barely any fabric here anymore. So you need to train them that they need to look at the fabric. Wow, like it's 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 no longer got the physical ounce weight, so it won't have the same arc thermal performance value. Thanks, Teddy. Let's. How often do you have to train your staff? I think we probably talked about it, correct? So training requirements minimum three years, but seventy and Z four six two also say that for emergencies or release of of shock, you have to do that annually, right? So there's some caveats to three years. Um, again, emergency release of a worker being shocked is one year. Uh, I said, you know, on the gloves, well, that'd be every three years, but I really recommend that you do like a six month recert, you know, and have it as a safety meeting and the supervisor or get one of the workers to volunteer on the pre-use inspection and checks the air and visual on this, right? So it's, it's, you know, minimum three for the, you know, for generic training, uh, one year for release. Uh, uh, by the way, releasing another hot topic, is how do you release a worker that's being shocked? Well, the first thing is turn off the power or insulate yourself or use some other means of, of removing, right? There's a new escape strap option for our clash PP, so FYI, and then training on that at different frequencies. It's also required anytime you're asked to do something that's, you're not, you don't meet the qualified worker requirements. So there's an interval that we've been talking about. I agree with all that. I'm just saying the only other part is if I'm asking you to do something you haven't done before, that's a training event. One last thing, with all this automation, there's a downside. So power circuit breaker racking systems, what if it, the battery, you know, doesn't, hasn't charged and doesn't work? So I recommend for power circuit breaker racking, at least annually, manually rack out a power circuit breaker because your, your, your racking system may fail. And then the worker's going, well, I, don't, I can't remember, I'm not comfortable doing it. So life occurrence will be lowered, right? So you got to watch all these benefits, this automation, Right, emergency racking systems, onboard racking. What happens if the onboard racking in the switchgear fails? I don't know how to emergency rack. So you got to retrain on those things. And that's what John was saying is we got to maintain some you know, competency here on manual racking when we have automated systems. All right, thanks. Uh, so next question is for you, Terry. I think what standards are the rules for? What is touch safe and what is not when it comes to shock and arc risk analysis? Uh, well, I'm going to rely on, on Charlie and John here too, but, you know, we've got, you know, IP ratings for finger safe, right? You know, there's, there's standards out there and we're relying on the manufacturers to bring us that with the products we procure. I said earlier that I think we need to change all of the standards, North American, international, and we should get more insulation installed at the factory and be willing to pay for that, right? If we can insulate the heck out of things, inadvertent movement risk, it doesn't exist. The shock hazard doesn't exist, right? So. Uh, John and Charlie, your your thoughts on again standards for you know touch safe insulation guarding? Go ahead, Charlie. Well, I, I know yes, there are standards, and typically, uh, as, as a quick explanation, it's usually uh, the size. If you can put your your small your pinky finger in the hole, uh, then it's not touch safe. It's not finger safe. Ingress um, protection. Yeah. Uh, also, with, though, with I, I see sometimes these customers and, and clients are, are thinking, well, all right, it's got a little piece of plastic above the lugs, a little red plastic or whatever color above the lugs, and, and that's finger safe or touch safe. Well, no, if you can reach your finger in behind it, that's just a little uh, plastic guard. That is not considered finger safe and touch safe. And, and Terry's right. It needs to be explained from the manufacturer. OK, this is uh, it, when it is finger safe and touch safe. And I, I mean, like the glass kind of provides just a barrier. It doesn't provide a finger safe. 
Yeah, right. let's call it differentiate between a dead front and a live front. It, the, the plexiglass is a, is a dead front for shock hazards, but it is not necessarily arc rated. So if you get an arc going behind a piece of plexiglass, unless it's properly rated, you're going to have molten plastic stuck to your chest. And so it's important to understand the difference in when it's a shock dead front versus an arc flash dead front. In general, that's the, the, that that plexiglass or Lexan is not a barrier for arc flash, and that's a good point, John. Right? It's a barrier for shock. We we assume right. it's not there if an arc flash occurs. Just like the doors, if you're doing through door racking, we assume the yeah. door's not there, and you need to have you know arc rated clothing on with an ETB equal to the energy on the label. Don't rely on barriers for arc flash. We don't. Yeah, I agree. With you. Thank you. So I think I'm gonna uh, have one question that's been asked. Uh, by one of the attendees, this is going to be the last one. Uh, this is product related again. So what they're asking is, we have a great product that's called a safe test point where you can put the probes and you can measure the voltage, right? So they're asking, the test points the state you need a CAT 3 meter, category 3, but specify the specs of a CAT 2 probes. So the question is, if it is a CAT 2, CAT 4 or CAT 3 probes, if you need to insert it inside the test points, it is not possible because of the exposed tip of a CAT3 and CAT4 gets to a very small, um, I mean, the, the conductors get to a very small probes. They can't access it. The question was, then why do you call this a CAT3 and CAT4, CAT4 meter requirements? So I just want to clarify this question because the CAT3 and CAT4 ratings and the probes apply to the actual point of test if you're doing it inside the cabinet, meaning, if you are touching your live conductors and measuring it inside the cabinet where your source is connected to, that point absolutely need to have that probes of CAT3 or CAT4. But at the safe test point, since we limit the current to 3.5 milliamps or less, that's the one thing. And the second thing is you are not directly exposed to this transient voltages in our safe test point because this test point is tested within the UL to take up to CAT4 ratings, which is a 7,300 volts requirement for the transient impulses. So that's been tested. So you don't have any exposure of a CAT4 transient pulses at the door when you use it. But why do we require you to use the CAT3 irrespective of that for the meter? Because we need to use the meter that's rated for the application, either CAT3 or a CAT4. That's the reason. Because even if you are unable to measure the voltage from outside the door with a CAT4 or a CAT3 probe, right? You're still going to measure it inside the cabinet or you're doing a test before touch. You need to have that CAT4 rating because that's what the application defines. So I think uh, that's pretty much, I think we're at 11.33. I think, uh, do you want to take one more question? Last question, gentlemen? Uh, sure. Okay, last question. Can a qualified person cross the limited approach boundary to create an electrically safe work condition without PPE? I think these boundaries are mixed up in this question, right? So right. You, you, you can't cross the restricted approach boundary, right? Without shock PPE, right? And then if you're inside the arc flash boundary and gonna be at the working distance, you need arc flash PP on right, you know, equal to or greater than the incident in the label or as defined by converting the arc flash PP category to a minimum arc rating of clothing. Yeah, yeah you, may, you may cross the arc flash boundary several feet away, but the, the, it's the both, one's shock protection, one's flash protection. It's a different question. So this is what I was trying to answer before, that as a finger step guarding that are access by cat two leads, okay. So yeah. I think uh, we answered pretty much most of the questions, I think there are more follow-up questions from the attendees. I would like to populate a spreadsheet and send it to the panelists and see if we can get a response from them and we'll publish that uh, by having the disclaimer, as we mentioned before, definitely with that guidelines, right? So, so yeah, please uh, uh, feel free to, I mean, please do take the uh, exit survey as you exit the webinar that gives us some feedback. And so we can come up with some good topics and we can gauge ourselves. And then thank you so much for your time. Again, for uh, we spent about an hour and a half, I guess. We answered a lot of questions. Again, thank you so much, Charlie, Terry Becker, and John Kolak for your valuable time in doing this. I think we're not promoting any product. As you guys know with our webinars, it's completely industry-centric topics. And please feel free to sign up for our blog where you can get 
the email notifications, and you can sign up for all this type of events in the future as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a Thanks, fantastic day. Thanks, John and Charlie. Take care, everybody. Be safe. Bye-bye.